So we are starting to record right now. Okay. Thank you all so much for your patience with this. Okay. Share screen, container herbs, share from beginning. Okay. So what exactly is an herb? Um, we hear people talk about herbs all the time. They like cooking with herbs. They like growing herbs. But what actually makes an herb? Uh, we never really think about the actual definition. Now, an herb, uh, by definition, is a soft-stemmed green plant. Um, now, some are woodier than others. Obviously, rosemary is a little bit woodier than lavender. Uh, but for the most part, they're soft-stemmed. They're not going to have a trunk um, or a lot of woody branches like you typically see with shrubs. They are typically non-tropical plants. So they are um, in a more temperate environment. You won't see many herbs in the rainforest. Even vanilla is actually a type of orchid, so it's not technically an herb. Um, and traditionally throughout the span of history, they have been used for medicine, for flavor, or for fragrance. Um, so they have a wide variety of uses because of um, their inherent aromatic properties, some can relax you, some can help you focus, things like that. Obviously the science is a little bit debatable, um, but anecdotal evidence is still some sort of evidence, you know. Now when you are considering growing your herbs, um, herbs are really great for container gardens, especially if you're like me and you don't have a lot of space and you don't have a lot of light. We only get about four hours of sunlight on my porch here. Um, and so I can't grow tomatoes, I can't grow squash, I can't grow any vegetables that I like to grow. I can grow herbs and I can grow mushrooms. And that's pretty much what we grow <laughs> on my porch. Um, so one of the things you should consider is obviously the space and light like we mentioned. Also the time of year. Right now, um, if you get that planting bug in March or early April before our frost date, um, our frost date's pretty easy to remember, it's tax day. So don't plant before tax day. But a lot of hardier herbs uh, like cilantro and oregano, herbs like that, they can actually tolerate large fluctuations in temperature. So if you're planting in early spring, um, these are really great options to get your garden started. Um, they handle that very, very well. I wouldn't recommend starting herbs later in the year, especially because so many of them are annuals. Um, so they may end up dying off. If you plant them in the middle of the summer, they could get a little stressed by the summer heat. So just take the time of year into account. Um, think about what varieties you may want. Um, every herb has a ton of different varieties. Lavender, there's English lavender, Spanish lavender, French lavender. Uh, rosemary has different varieties that grow to different sizes. Basil has sweet basil, large leaf basil, uh, a more peppery variety, Thai basil. Endless possibilities depending on um, what your interests are. And also take into account what type of media you want to grow in. When I talk about media, typically we don't grow plants truly in soil and when they're in containers because topsoil and Georgia red clay holds a lot of water. And the last thing you want to happen in your container is too much water on those roots. So when you use a media like potting soil or if you create your own media, um, it's actually really helpful to increase drainage. And you're obviously not really gonna have that much soil, actual soil in it. Um, but it will still have all the nutrients you need um, and things like that. So um, also think about what you like. If you like to cook a lot of Asian food, plant a lot of Asian herbs. Um, you know, plant scallions, plant cilantro, uh, plant Thai basil, things that go well with that. If you like um, Mediterranean food, you know, a lot of parsley, a lot of uh, 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 Greek oregano, a lot of mint and dill as well as um, uh, kind of like Cuban, South American food. There is a Mexican oregano variety. Uh, so just kind of think about what kind of cuisines you like and what you wanna do with your herbs. Now, once you decide to actually grow herbs, um, think about what you're gonna actually need them for. So we talked about the different culinary endeavors, but there's way more that you can do with herbs than just cooking. Um, they're very useful for fragrance, so you can make little potpourri pouches. You can also make essential oils out of them um, as 
kind of a perfume or to use in soap making. Um, and so I've kind of broken down into three main uses, fragrance, cooking, and teas. Those are the most common uses for herbs. Uh, it's what I use herbs for. There are other uses, I'm sure, um, but this is kind of the best way uh, to break down herbal uses. So for fragrance, these are all some examples of what does well in Georgia specifically. And I am, uh, of course, I'm, I work in Atlanta. I live in Decatur. So this is kind of the area that we're thinking about. I would say it can go up to, you know, Alpharetta, North Georgia, and then all the way down to Macon. But depending on how resilient these herbs are, they can probably fit throughout all of Georgia. You just need to be careful of frost dates with them. So things like hyssop, uh, lavender, comfrey, lemon verbena, rue, and yarrow are really, really great for fragrance. Um, this is also good if you just want fragrance around you on your patio. Uh, if something is fragrant, that means it's also probably going to attract pollinators um, if it's fragrant and it flowers. So that's something to consider as well. Lavender is a great pollinator plant, specifically the Spanish lavender. The bees, the native bees just love it. They go wild over it because the stems are so strong, it can actually support them. Um, cooking, we've talked about these a little bit. Basil, chives, cilantro, dill, mint, oregano, parsley, and thyme. Um, some of these are annuals, some of these are perennials. Some of these are technically annu annuals, but they come back every couple of years for some reason. Um, you just gotta kind of find out what works for you, but we can go over that a little bit more specifically later. And then finally, teas. Um, teas are a really good use of your herbs because there are some times that you harvest it and you're just like, what am I gonna do with all of this mint? Uh, even though it's in a small container, it's taken over, it's falling over the side, there's just so much of it. Um, you can use mint for any three of these purposes. Uh, so there's also holy basil, which is also known as Tulsi, the um, UGA garden in Athens, the research farm, actually grows a lot of this and sells it in a tea mixture. Chamomile, the flowers are fabulous for teas. Uh, talked about mint and lemon balm. Lemon balm is also really good for pollinators once it goes to flower. So also consider how much space do you have? And I've listed out a couple herbs that are good for different scenarios. So if you have, a, like here we have a couple of corners on my porch that could really handle a nice tall herb or something nice and tall and flowering for some interest. Anise, hyssop, yarrow, lemon verbena, and fennel are all really attractive herbs. They're very fragrant. Um, the yarrow especially dries very well. Um, so a lot of people, when they use yarrow, they typically use the root, but the dried flowers are gorgeous. Um, they hold up very, very well. They hold up better than hydrangeas or any other flowers that I've seen. Um, and they have a texture kind of similar to Dusty Miller. So very, very, very pretty. Um, as far as medium or mounding, that's gonna be a lot of what you see on my porch. That's the really good standard container plants. Uh, so your basil, your sage, your lavender, your scented geraniums, um, things like that. Even chives uh, work pretty well. They don't actually grow too tall. Uh, scallions will grow a little bit taller. And then as far as small and spreading, I tried to think of some more, but honestly, thyme is my go-to for this. You can use thyme as a ground cover. Um, it's, it kind of creeps. Sometimes it will get upright if it has a lot of sunlight and a lot of space um, and it starts to flower, it will perk up and go vertical. But for the most part, if you are continuously harvesting it and using it, um, it will stay kind of flat. Um, so of course there may be some air circulation issues that can be a um, problem with moisture, but if you continuously harvest it, that shouldn't be a problem. And again, we'll go over that in a little bit. So there's a couple of different ways you can start um, your herbs, your herb garden. You can start it from seed. Um, so you can start it in a separate container. I get a lot of questions about this. Well, if I'm starting a plant in a container anyway, why do I need to start it, start the seed in the flat? Can't I just throw the seed into the potting soil? Technically you can, and you may have success. I recommend starting individual seeds in individual flats or cells or like in the upper right, that's a little peat pellet, um, starting seeds like that because those are going to need specific media called seed starting mix. Seed starting mix drains even faster 
than normal potting soil or potting mix because the number one killer of seedlings is root rot or dampening off and that's too much moisture around uh, the plant. So I always recommend putting your seeds directly in seed starting mix, not necessarily potting soil. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about how to transplant and transfer in a, in a little bit, but then you'll move it to the actual container. Um, read your seed label. When you have, uh, if you are, if you buy some seeds from Lowe's or Pike's or online, that seed label is going to tell you so much. And I thought I had one right with me, um, but I, I think it blew away or something. But um, so much information is on the back of that seed packet. It's going to tell you how long it takes to mature, how big it's going to get, what kind of spacing it needs, what kind of sunlight it needs. Um, if it's an annual, if it's a perennial, is it frost tolerant? That seed packet on that, that back of that seed packet is your plant Bible, essentially. You're going to go step by step, and that's going to tell you everything you need to know about your plant. Um, and then also what you'll need to do if you do kind of all dump your seeds in the one container, because you never just want to plant one seed in a single container, because if that seed dies, then you have to start all over, um, or if that seedling dies. So we recommend putting a couple. So if you don't want to do individual cells, you can um, pick your finishing container, the one that you want the plant to end up in. You can sprinkle the seeds around, water it in according to the seed packet instructions. But what you'll need to do is eventually thin out those seedlings because you're going to plant probably too many seeds to make sure that you have enough seedlings that are actually successful. They're not all going to be able to stay in that pot. So you can either space them out according to the seed packet instructions. Um, so if they need six inches, if they need a foot apart, um, that information will be on there. But you'll definitely need to thin out your seedlings because that will make healthier plants in the long run. So once your seedlings uh, develop their first true leaves, and here's a great example of that in the upper right, um, you can see when a seedling first bursts, um, honestly, the, the most um, distinctive character, the most distinctive example I have is um, radishes because they have those little heart-shaped leaves. And then every leaf after that is going to be a true leaf. But that's the same for all seeds. So you can see here those elongated leaves. Those are just the, the first little seed um, leaves that come off. They're not really very useful and they won't last very long. Um, they're just to kind of get the seed started. But once you start to see lobing on the leaves, see a little bit of color, um, those are the first true leaves. Now, if we were gearing up to transplant these in the ground, we would put these in a bigger pot, a bigger temporary pot with potting mix. And then in a couple of weeks, um, when it looks to be about the size of the bottom picture, it has several sets of true leaves, you can put it in the ground. But because we're container gardening, you can put your seedlings, when they look just like in the upper right, you can just go ahead and put them in their finishing container. Whatever container you want them to end up in for the rest of the summer or the rest of the fall, just go ahead and plop them right in um, into that potting mix because they've gone through the hard part already. They've got um, several, they've got, you know, a couple true leaves and you don't need to keep moving them from pot to pot, okay? Now, it wouldn't be container gardening without containers, right? So when you are actually choosing a container, um, four important things to keep in mind that can really affect your plant health. One is drainage. This is gonna be key, and you're gonna get tired of me saying it, uh, drainage, drainage, drainage. So you really wanna make sure that there are, um, there's some sort of mechanism in that pot, even if it's just a hole in the bottom, or if it's some sort of dish, it allows the extra water to escape. You don't want water sitting on your plant roots, okay? So I'm getting a note that my connection is a little bit unstable. Just um, bear with me here. Everything's looking good on my end though. Okay, cool, just wanted to check in there. Um, so always make sure that there is drainage. Um, never, never let your plants sit in water. 
you want to put your finger into the soil about one to two inches and if it's dry then you water it um, and you can water it I always say water it until it pees water it until you see water coming out the other end um, and then it's perfectly fine you're probably going to need to do this every day in the summer in Georgia but here I've gotten three to five days without watering in these temperatures. My plants are perfectly happy the way they are right now. Um, the second consideration is size. So herbs do pretty well in just one gallon or less, depending on if they're annual or perennial. Um, pretty much almost everything I have is one gallon or less with my herbs and they do really, really well all year. Um, but again, that's because I'm also harvesting and cutting them back. If you just want to let something grow wild and take over, like you just want to plant a rosemary uh, bush and forget about it, I would recommend five gallons or larger. Um, so again, depending on the maintenance you want to put into it, depending on your own space allowance, um, that's going to determine the size that you want. Also, um, ma the material matters too. So if you have a terracotta pot, that may, uh, obviously they're gonna be a little bit more delicate um, than something finished or metal or wood. Um, they're also going to heat up potentially a lot faster, not as fast as metal would. Um, if metal is sitting in the sun, that's gonna heat up very, very fast. That's gonna get your roots very hot. And similarly with color, if you have something black, it's gonna heat up a lot faster than um, a white container. So that's something to consider. Here it's not too much of an issue because we don't get that much direct sunlight. We can kind of get away with whatever colors we want. Um, but I do recommend, you know, being very colorful and integrating um, a bunch of different colors and patterns into your garden because that's going to attract a lot of different pollinators as well. Uh, different colors attract different flies, bees, wasps, hummingbirds, things like that. Um, so you'll see I love hummingbirds, so I have a lot of red on my porch. Um, and then also just some different colors I'll show you in a little bit, but those are important considerations as well. And we get a lot of people that worry about just not having enough space even for containers. And my answer to that is just you have to get a little bit creative. Um, so you can elevate your plants. These are a couple cool ideas I found online. Um, so one is uh, the frame to an old window. They reinforced it with some extra wood. Um, you, Pallets are also a great tool. I mean, so many of us are on uh, Pinterest looking for <laughs> ideas, especially being trapped at the house right now. Um, so this is a really great way to elevate your plants. You can um, make shelves or you can install hooks and have them latch onto that pallet. Um, and then also just some lattice board or pegboard can also be a good way to elevate your plants. These are going to be for smaller plants. Um, I typically see this with succulents, but depending on the strength of your lattice, you can actually put a couple of decent sized herbs on here and that elevates them up a wall so you don't have all these plant pots on your railing, all on your patio in your walking space. Um, it really helps you maximize uh, that space and light availability as well. Because if you're stacking everybody next to each other, as the sun moves, eventually certain things are gonna get shaded out, especially if you have herbs of different sizes. This helps keep everybody uniform with the same sun exposure as well. Also, uh, when we are in containers, we need to manage our water very, very wisely. Not only uh, are they sensitive to overwatering, they can also dry out a lot more quickly than something planted in the ground because they don't have that soil and they don't have that clay. So it is kind of a double-edged sword. But there are a lot of different ways that we can mitigate this. And you'll see my personal solution in a second, um, but if you have here, you can see I'm kind of shaded. We have a balcony. We're not getting rain on my porch. But if you have a balcony and you can get a rail hanger like here, you can set it outside of that shaded area and outside of that rain shadow um, to make sure that it gets adequate water without you having to do too much work unless there's a drought. Um, you can also get some of these rolling pots like on the right. They actually have a water reservoir. Um, so you can keep the water in there and dump it out and reuse it. Uh, I don't recommend keeping the water in there for more than four days. Uh, one, because the, the roots, it will affect the roots. And two, mosquitoes will love it. Uh, they love dirty organic matter filled water. 
Um, so that can be a problem, but mosquitoes take seven days to mature in the summer heat. So if you dump it out every three or four days, the mosquito larvae will never actually mature. So if you have bird baths, small little water sources like that, just something to consider. And then they, we've also got these little plant partners here. They're little terracotta spikes that you can put a uh, water bottle into and it slow releases the water um, throughout the pot. So it lasts a day or two in the summer heat. And if you're going away for the weekend and you don't want your plants to wilt, this is a good option. Uh, you can also just stick the bottles directly in the soil too and not pay for that. Um, but it's whatever, whatever works for you and whatever you would like to experiment with. Um, so some tools of the trade, I always uh, stress this. I feel like when we talk about planting, we don't talk enough about what you need to actually do it. So of course, watering can is number one. This is mine. It's big, but I have a lot of pots. Um, so get something that's comfortable. You can get something with multiple handles so you can kind of change the angle. It does have a little rain spout attachment that you typically see. I take it off. Um, because I just don't want a lot of water on the foliage. If you have a smaller spout, you can get under the foliage better. That will reduce your disease risk and you won't get sunburned um, with, from the water droplets sitting on those leaves. Uh, also a trowel. They have several, um, several really great ergonomic options nowadays, but this is just my old standby. You can see it's absolutely filthy. <laughs> this is very recently used, um, but it has kind of a comfort grip. You can really get in there. Um, don't bother with the plastic trowels. They're not going to work well. Um, wooden trowels are okay for house plants, but if you're really working outside a lot with some moist soil, you really want something um, stainless, something very durable. Gloves, of course. Um, you can get the nitrile or silicone dipped. You can get kid skin gloves. There are all sorts of different options, uh, but always recommend gloves because uh, we do love spiders. We want spiders in our garden, uh, but we don't want to startle our spiders. And if we do, we want to make sure that our hands don't get uh, the business end of that spider or things like that. If you're growing, you know, roses or anything with thorns, barberry, um, you just want to be protected. Label everything, keep the labels. If you buy transplants, um, then just keep the labels with the plant. Keep your seed packets, use that as a label. Just make sure that you know what you're growing. Um, I also keep a little bit of twine on hand for harvesting the herbs and hanging them. Um, also a mortar and pestle because that's gonna be important later. Uh, we'll go over how to grind herbs, when to grind herbs, um, things like that. Extra containers, remember I said thinning out those seedlings. You don't just wanna thin out the seedlings and kind of chuck them, you don't wanna waste them, um, but you can put them in some extra containers, give them away to friends. Always keep extra soil on hand. Um, I accidentally bought two huge bags of soil this year, uh, so we definitely have plenty of extra soil. Um, again, just in case you need to divide plants, something unexpected happens. Keep a journal um, so that you know what does well. So I have a little garden journal and I made notes of when my lavender died, when my rosemary died, and when my parsley died because I cannot grow any of those um, here. We do not get enough sun and definitely would have forgotten that if I didn't write it down. Um, have some seed saving containers, some little paper envelopes, Tupperware, things like that, and uh, some clippers or a harvesting knife. So I mean, these are actual pruners, but you can get some clippers that are like a miniature version of this. So this is more meant for shrub branches, like woody things. It would work really great for rosemary, those tougher uh, branches, but for just normal herbs, you can also use kitchen shears or a very sharp curved harvesting herb knife. Um, just make sure it's very sharp. You don't want to rip anything. Um, you want a very clean cut. Um, when you store seeds, the most important thing to do is label them. Um, so many times I've tried to store seeds thinking, oh, I'll remember this next year, and I don't. Um, so always label that this is a great example. Obviously, it's probably more in-depth than what we want to do, um, but this is actually from a seed bank. But the idea is the same. You put the species and variety, you put the date the seeds were harvested, um, and herbs if you know like the basics about herbs, you know that you don't really want them to go to flower if you're using them in cooking, but occasionally like things like dill and fennel 
fenugreek, uh, things that you want to use the seeds of, you will let it go to flower and you will let those um, flowers kind of bloom out. And once they've dried out a little bit, you can take those flower heads, put them in a paper bag, just like you see here, um, or like a lunch sack, shake out the um, flower head and all the seeds will come out and you can store them like that. And you wanna store your seeds in a cool, dry place away from sunlight, otherwise they will sprout. You don't want any moisture and you don't want too much heat. You want them to stay asleep as long as possible. So as far as maintenance, um, just kind of general maintenance, once you've planted your herbs and you're going through the summer, even though a lot of plants say that they tolerate drought well, you're still gonna need to water them. Still water them um, when they need it. Don't test that. Uh, you can let the plants dry out completely. Don't let the soil stay completely dry for more than one or two days, unless you have something like a fungus gnat problem or you see some mold or something like that and may need to dry out a little bit longer, um, depending on your watering habits. But please stay on top of it uh, with the water, even if something is advertised as drought resistant. Nothing is as drought resistant as it's advertised. I can promise you that. Um, you may also consider root pruning for perennials. Um, so I had a sage plant for about five years and they don't usually last that long in containers, but um, every year I would take it out and kind of nip the roots a little bit and that prevents it from getting root bound. Um, so the roots in the, in the pot are going to mimic what's happening at the top. Okay, so you'll see kind of very similar distributions there. Um, and if your plant looks a little bit stunted and it's in a smaller container, odds are it's root bound. And this is a really good example of that, this picture right here. Um, so, and then we're gonna, I'm just double checking some things. We are good for time, okay. Um, yeah, so just all you have to do is just take some scissors uh, or you can take a knife and score the edges. Very simple to do. Um, you just have to be careful taking those herbs out and putting them back in and always make sure they're adequately watered and you replace some of the soil. And then also scale up pots when needed. So the first couple of years with that sage plant, root pruning did me okay, but it really wanted to get bigger. So I ended up just having to put it in a, a bigger pot. And sometimes you're gonna have to do that, especially with rosemary. It starts out nice and, and uh, tolerable. You know, you can put it in a, a little one gallon. It's gonna keep growing and growing and growing. It's gonna be one of the larger space requirements. So think of like a five to 10 gallon container for perennial herbs like that. You will need to scale up. And then don't be afraid to get creative. Um, so I see a lot of these plastic bottles um, as long as you don't let them heat up too much, they're actually good for a couple of months. It's a really great project with the grandkids, um, or if you're a teacher, it's a good school project. They last about a semester, and then you get rid of them, and you, we, Lord knows we have enough plastic that we can reuse this for. And this is a great example of kind of that elevation idea I was talk, talking to you about. They're all on the same plane, but they all have the same light exposure. Um, the only thing I can see here that would be a little bit tricky is watering, but plastic, it's very easy to drill a hole in the bottom and make sure it drains out. Um, and then here, you know, you can just have different arrangements of pots. This is just, um, it's at a historic garden. I'm not quite sure where, but just all these little herbs and pots up some stairs um, or, you know, using different shelf units to really, when you don't have that much space, elevation is gonna be your key source of interest. Um, and creative expression in addition to color. So think of ideas on how you can work with that. So next, uh, harvesting and preserving. Uh, one of the main things people grow herbs for is to eventually use them. So you're gonna harvest immediately before bloom. Uh, basil is a really great example of this. Thyme, you can kind of see it. Oregano, it's a little bit harder to tell, but you will see, um, in addition to the, the kind of leafy stems, they'll start to get these buds that have a lot of really small and tightly packed leaves. That is when you wanna harvest because if you let it go another couple of days, it's gonna flower. And then all those oils that make those herbs taste and smell so nice are gonna be in the flowers. They're not gonna be in the leaves. And you're gonna have a lot less flowers than you will leaves. So that's why you wanna um, make sure to harvest them on time. 
Now things like chamomile that you are specifically harvesting the flowers for tea, obviously you wanna let it flower. Um, if you just wanna have things for your pollinators, let them flower, the pollinators love it. But if you are harvesting your plants to use them in cooking or teas or fragrance, it's very important to harvest them at this point. Um, if they are dirty, uh, so if they have potting soil on them, if they have pollen all over them, if you're not sure what's been sprayed nearby, um, wash them immediately and then let them dry out completely. Typically what I do is I will wash them in a colander, try not to bruise them too much, but then I'll let them all dry out um, on a paper towel on like a cooling rack. So like when you're baking those kind of mesh wire, elevated wire racks. And it usually takes a couple hours, but you really wanna make sure that they are completely dry and devoid of any extra moisture on their surface before you hang them up to dry. Because then um, it'll be too compact and you'll get some mold growing and you don't want that. Um, you're gonna tie them into bundles. So here's a good example of what uh, your bundles will look like. So this is some mint from last year uh, that I harvested. And you can tie them into a couple different bundles. These are not labeled because they're actually labeled on my wall. <laughs> and you'll see a picture, picture of that. Um, but this is the twine I was talking about. Also, if you don't want to bother with twine and you have some extra dental floss hanging around, dental floss actually works just as well. And you can tie it a little bit tighter. Um, and you know you don't have to go to a craft store for it if you have it hanging around. But you always wanna tie them at the stems. I usually take off uh, the kind of last little bit of leaves just so I can have a clean surface to tie and you hang them upside down for a couple weeks in a warm, dry place. It does not necessarily need to be cool. It can be a little warmer, like room temperature about 75 degrees. Um, if you want to dry your leaves immediately, you can leave them in the oven at 100 degrees for three to five hours, but you're gonna need to check them every 30 minutes. Do not dry your herbs in the microwave. It will end in disaster. I promise you, I've tried it several times. I can't get it to work. Um, so maybe on a lower power, maybe experiment if you want, but I will not recommend trying to dry your herbs in a microwave. Um, you can also uh, freeze your herbs. We recommend taking the leaves individually off the stem, um, kind of stacking them and placing them in a freezer bag. Um, and you can freeze them for a couple of months and then take them out to use later. If you freeze something like basil or mint though, just know it may be a little brown or black. It's still usable but cold damages these. Um, so if you actually store your basil in the fridge, it's gonna start to get black and get spotty. Um, but that doesn't, that's not mold or anything, that's just a little bit of damage to the leaves. And always remember, um, even though I'm not a family and consumer sciences agent, I am an ag agent, I love to cook with herbs. So I like to remind people, dried herbs are for cooking, fresh herbs are for finishing. So when you take a pizza out of the oven, you're gonna throw fresh basil leaves on top. But that pizza sauce, you use dried oregano when you simmered it. So that's just something to remember. Of course you can freestyle it, um, but that's just a basic rule of thumb for this. Here's an example of my harvesting <laughs> station. Um, so this is actually my laundry room. Um, I just kind of put some nails into the wall and I hang my herbs upside down there. It's nice and warm because we run the dryer there. Um, but we're constantly in and out because it's also our pantry, so there's good air circulation. Um, the light doesn't really matter. Um, the light requirements, it, it won't, it's not like seeds. They're not going to re-sprout. Um, but then once they're dried and they're ready to um, come off of your wall because you're going to keep harvesting, you need more space, what I recommend doing is taking the leaves off. Um, you don't really want your stems in there, but just take the leaves off. Don't grind them yet. And then... Um, go ahead and put them in a small bag, whatever size bag you need. I like to use these little snack bags uh, because they're at the rate we use them, they're just the most appropriate. And then go ahead and label it. Um, you wanna use it within the year if possible, but dried spices keep a very long time. You'll notice that these are not ground. I only grind my spices right before I use them. Okay, so keep them as leaves. And then when you're ready, take them out and grind them in a mortar and pestle. So here are an, uh, some examples of herbs that do really, really well here. 
Um, I'm gonna go over a couple in this presentation and then we're gonna switch to a more interactive version where I actually show you my plants and get to see how they're doing. Um, I will uh, share the publication that I got this information out of. Um, it's called Herbs of Southern Gardens um, and it's very extensive. So I will be emailing that out afterwards. Um, but basil, mint, catnip, yarrow, oregano, sage, rosemary, thyme, and lavender. If you have full sun, these are all great. Um, if you do not have full sun, I would recommend basil, mint, catnip, um, and oregano and thyme. Though so that's basically what I have. So that's what we stick with here because we don't have a lot of sunlight. So I'm gonna show you what I can't grow just so we can talk about it here and you do have some sort of visual. Um, and again, pardon the mockingbird, he's been coming and going again, just kind of adding to the ambiance. Um, but there are several different varieties of uh, lavender. There is the tr more traditional English lavender. This is what a lot of lavender farms will use. Um, and when you see kind of scenic expanses of lavender rows, um, it's usually English lavender. That's basically what's, what's farmed. Um, there's also French lavender, which is similar to the English lavender, and there's Spanish lavender, which is a little bit more um, bulbous. So it's got a little bit more of um, a, uh, almost spherical, but not quite. It's just um, got more of a flower head as opposed to flower buds going up a stalk. This is the one I said that our pollinators absolutely love though, and it does very, very well in Georgia. It's a warmer purple, whereas the English lavender is more of a cooler purple. So just in case that matters to your color palette. There are also a couple different varieties of rosemary, depending on drought tolerance and size. You can see it gets really, really big. This is why I recommended getting a bigger container for your rosemary. It will continue to grow and grow and grow. Um, rosemary, because you're gonna have so much of it, it's okay to let it flower. And it's actually a really great um, pollinator plant as well. They love those blue flowers with the deep throats. Um, and you're gonna have so much rosemary, not all of it's gonna be flowering at once. So it's still gonna have that really strong, um, spicy herbal scent, no matter what. I love, when I'm on a walk, I just run my hand through a rosemary bush and it stays with you all day. It's very fragrant. Um, and then finally we have yarrow. Yarrow is more of a decorative plant. Um, you can use the roots and you can dry the uh, flowers, again, the, the flowers preserve very, very well, flowers and stems. Um, so I recommend growing this if you have kind of a lot of elevation, if you have a lot of height that you need to take up and full sun. This is also gonna be really great for your pollinators. It comes in a wide variety of colors everywhere from white, purple, pink, uh, like a purplish blue, yellow, orange, red, it's almost the entire spectrum. Um, you have a lot of different varieties of yarrow here. Um, so with that, I'm gonna stop our screen share. And um, let's see, we've got a lot of questions, but let me just take you on a little tour of uh, my patio here. I'm gonna unplug. Hopefully we keep our connection. Hope nobody gets seasick. Um, but as you can see, we've got kind of some direct sunlight right here. So all of my plants are along the railing. This is a really great spot for them. Um, this railing is not wood. I would recommend um, if you do have a wooden railing, doing something to elevate it or maybe getting a rack that kind of offsets it. You don't want any of that water pouring out of your pot to cause any uh, wood rot. And you'll notice on a lot of my pots, um, I also have these kind of plastic dishes. Uh, not only does that help conserve water, it's also me trying to be courteous of my neighbors because I don't want water constantly dripping down on their porch either while they're eating lunch or something. Um, so it helps with neighbor relations. And you'll notice a lot of the glass bottles here. Um, this is my mechanism for self-watering. All you have to do is fill the water, uh, fill, the, fill the bottle with water and stick it upside down and the plant's gonna take it up as it needs it. Um, so the, this is my go-to. It has not done me wrong. I have not lost a single plant to over or under watering since I have started that. Um, so here we have mint. 
And I'm gonna come back to this mint because we're gonna do a harvesting demo um, in a couple minutes. But this mint, it's just a uh, mojito mint. So there's julep mint, spearmint, uh, mojito mint, all sorts of different mint, chocolate mint, orange mint, apple mint, um, with a lot of different cool taste varieties. But I always recommend growing mint in a container anyway because it will always take over a garden. Um, this is my little sage plant. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, I had a sage plant that grew for five years. So this one is definitely gonna need to be up potted. Um, this is just in kind of a blue and gold and white pot that I actually painted. So again, get you a terracotta pot and have some fun with it if you need some color. This is my thyme. It's looking a little bit sparse right now, um, but that's because I actually just harvested it. Um, thyme, I usually grow lemon thyme. I wasn't able to find lemon thyme this year, um, but that's just the traditional English thyme variety. Lemon thyme is also very pretty. It's got kind of a variegation to it. It's got different colors on the leaves. Um, and then here we have my basil plant. Um, and basil is very similar to rosemary. You just touch it and you smell like it. Again, this is short because I've already harvested some. Um, we love to make pasta sauces, so it doesn't last too long. Here we have uh, catnip, and catnip is actually just a really pretty plant. It's got some heart-shaped leaves um, with serrated edges. So even if you don't have cats, I have two cats who absolutely love it. One has just given up on trying to break out onto the patio with me. Um, but they really, really, one of my cats loves it fresh. The other one loves it dried. You dry it just like a regular herb. You harvest it right before the bud comes up. Um, but they love it, it's not bad for them, um, but it's, it's really fun to have around. This guy, I really wanna talk about for a second. I don't know, let me see. Yes, you can see them. So this is what is marketed as a mosquito plant. And it is technically not citronella, even though people call it the citronella plant. Citronella is actually a grass. That is the only plant that repels mosquitoes. This is a citronella scented geranium. So it is actually a geranium and it does not produce citronella. So that means if you make an essential oil from it, which I'm actually, I have a little bit of an experiment going on here. Um, I have, it got so tall I had to harvest it. So I didn't know what to do with the leaves. So this is canola oil in a little uh, pint jar and I just keep it out in the sunlight for a couple weeks and you should be able to um, get some essential oil from that. But these guys, they're good to have. I really love the shape of geranium leaves. That's why we keep it. Um, and I also just like the smell of citronella, but it will not help you. If you rub the leaves on your skin, it's not gonna help you deter mosquitoes. Um, so just know that. Um, this is not an herb, but it's a cute little plant and it's very tasty. It's called sorrel. It is a green. Um, and you can tell by the green and red uh, coloration. It's actually very closely related to rhubarb. So that's what gives it its bitter flavor, if you've ever tried rhubarb stems. Um, so it does actually contain oxalic acid, but even with rhubarb, you would actually have to eat 11 pounds of the leaves to be sick. Um, this, again, this is my oregano plant. It looks a lot sadder than it really is because I just harvested it. So, um, but oregano is great. It's a little bit fuzzy. It's not a really good herb to use raw. Really recommend drying it out, letting those hairs fall off. And then over here is our experimental uh, scallion garden. A lot of people I've seen all over the uh, social media, uh, all over Facebook, all over the internet, they're starting to grow their own scallions and it does work. So it works if you put them in water. I recommend just using some of that extra soil putting them in here, they're gonna go grow twice as fast and they're gonna be much happier. Um, we go through a lot of scallions in our house. So um, I just like to have those on hand. So now the last thing I have, I'm just gonna show you how to harvest your herbs and what that's gonna look like as they grow. So like I said, we're gonna take Mr. Mint here. He's been needing a good harvest, but I left him for all of us. Um, you can see I have previously harvested, this may be kind of hard to see, um, but what you want to do is when you harvest your plants, you always want to take it down below a leaf, okay? So right below the leaf, 
And then what's going to happen is you're going to have two other branches sprout up. So sometimes when you plant your transplants in a container, we actually recommend pinching off the top. That's going to cause it to be bushier. You're, you'll get more yields. But what we're going to do here is I'm going to take my scissors and we are just going to clip him. And see, he has this many leaves. So it's okay if it's not like a long sprig of mint. This is enough to, you know, use in a tea or put in a cocktail or in a lemonade, something like that. It's definitely enough to make a difference in flavor. Um, but what I may do, I may take off these little leaves um, and then keep harvesting, keep harvesting. Um, so let me take this other one off. Take these bottom leaves off. And when you do something like that, you take the little leaves off, stick them in a bag and stick them in your fridge. You can use them later. Um, and then you just kind of group the stems together like that. And then that's what you'll wrap up and that's how you'll hang it. Um, and then here, let me see if I can actually show you up close. This little guy is the one I just cut. And you can see how he was already harvested and he has one two little stems. So that means he's going to grow into four stems. So he's going to be even bushier. Um, so just take that into account when you do harvest as a, uh, according to like the general shape of the plant. Okay, so that's kind of all I had for hands on because I want to give plenty of time for questions. Um, we have several, several questions. Um, oh, lots of compliments. Thank y'all. <laughs> um, nice idea with the bottles. Yep, you can use any type of bottle, really. I recommend glass bottle as opposed to plastic. These bottles have lasted me uh, four years now. Uh, so really, really recommend that. Um, yeah, so the color of the glass bottles doesn't really matter. It can be clear, it can be blue, it can be brown, red, whatever works. Um, oh, what about dust? If you have a dusty house. <laughs> Yes, we, I should dust more uh, than I do. So very similar. Um, I would recommend a setup kind of like we have where it's in the laundry room. It's not in a main part of the house where people are consistently active. It's not kicking up a lot of dust. Um, now granted, we do have lint occasionally when we do laundry once a week um, or things like that. But for the most part, we haven't really had too much of an issue. I don't really see anything settling on it. Um, they're actually next to the washer, not the dryer. So um, yeah, just try to set them kind of aside if you can. So a garage is also a great option. Um, would recommend staying away from basements because there can be so many moisture issues, but a garage, a utility room, laundry room, um, pantry can be really great options. So almost kind of like a closet environment. That may help if your house is very dusty. Ooh, y'all, so many questions. Okay, I'm gonna work from the bottom up. Um, yes, and a fine mesh bag too. Definitely wanna make sure that air can get through, but uh, dust particles, um, not quite so much. What do you think about growing herbs in a container like a mason jar um, inside a kitchen window that gets good sun? I say, go for it. Uh, but the one thing you need to be careful of is that water retention and that moisture. Um, so never overwater them. They will use up the water that you give them. Just give them a little bit of water at a time um, and beware of fungus gnats. So make sure that is soil. Don't just grow them in water. Uh, they won't do well. They'll eventually just die. Um, um, ooh, growing cilantro. I'm terrible at that. <laughs> um, but some tips. It is pretty cold hardy but it can be very, very sensitive to humidity. It can be very finicky and very hard to grow. It, we actually just installed some at our community garden and two weeks later, two weeks of a lot of love and attention, it just is not succeeding. Um, so I think cilantro is one of those plants that when it is successful, we're just not sure why, um, but my recommendations are gonna be well, well, well drained soil. Um, not too hot, it does not handle hot, hot heat very well, can get pretty sunburned, um, but it is pretty cold tolerant. Um, should fertilizer be added to herbs, and if so, when or how often? I've never had to do it, not in containers. 
Um, if you have some stunting or some yellowing or problems in your landscape, that would be one thing. Never had to do it with herbs um, because a lot of fertilizers are geared towards flowering and you don't want your herbs to flower for the most part. Um, and sometimes it can actually just make them grow too fast. And you can also accumulate a lot of salt buildup um, it, from the fertilizer. So um, a lot of potting soils also come with fertilizer in them and they feed for about six months. That's perfectly fine. Um, but you don't need to continuously add fertilizer to herbs. I would not uh, recommend that. Basil will not make it through the winter. Basil is the one herb I can definitively say will always be an annual. Um, but if towards the end of the summer, uh, once, you, once your basil plant is pretty big, let a couple of those stalks flower and let those flowers dry out and go to seed. It does re-sprout from seed very, very well. Um, where to get holy, a lot of different nurseries are gonna have holy basil plants. Um, the U Garden in Athens may sell seeds, I'm not quite sure, um, but it's a really nice earthy uh, flavor, whereas um, most basil is very peppery. Um, this is a, a nice kind of deep earthy flavor and, and scent. Um, I'm really sorry, I'm trying to do my best with all these questions. Um, hey, Melissa? Um, yes. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. There was a question about, do herbs need soil amendments? Do herbs need soil amendments? Right. Oh, yeah, okay. So um, that's something I wasn't sure if we had time to get into. Um, when you're making your potting mix, you can use, uh, and in that herb publication and in our container gardening publication, we have kind of a, a, a recipe for it, but you can do 50% compost to 50% actual soil. Um, you just don't want to use all soil, like from your garden. You can't do that. It has to be greatly, greatly amended or just straight up use potting mix. So you can add compost. I wouldn't recommend adding only compost. Uh, so I know Soil 3 uh, kind of markets their, um, their compost. It's still got sand in it. It's still got minerals in it. So it's, it still has some soil components. So that's a really good soil um, option. And then just regular potting soil. And if you wanna make your own, like I said, just getting like some regular bagged compost and not necessarily manure, just compost and uh, some topsoil and just kind of mixing them together. All right, Ashley, did you catch any other ones? Yes, so there's another question about how long should you keep your potting soil? How long, I replace it annually because I usually get the potting soil that uh, feeds for about six months. Uh, that's usually to get the plants established and to help uh, with the stress of transplanting. Um, I don't introduce any more fertilizer, but the potting soil, I usually just replace it annually. I toss it out, or you can mix it half and half with new soil. That's what I would recommend. What other ones? Thank you for helping me moderate, Ashley. Ashley is our Muscogee County a and agent. She, uh, is helping me do this seminar series. <laughs> um, so another question was, what about insects on your herbs before picking or harvest? Yeah, so insects will probably be an issue. I think I actually, well, even though they're not insects, I think I may have a spider mite problem. Um, I would be, with insects in a container garden, a lot of what you're gonna be doing is just squishing them. Um, we don't recommend using pesticides that much in a container garden. One, because a lot of people wanna stay organic and if you have flowering plants and non-flowering plants um, and you use an organic pesticide, that also kills bees. Organic pesticides are non-specific. Um, so they kill everything they come into contact with. Now you can spray an organic pesticide around 7 or 8 p.m. after the bees have all gone um, and it will dry overnight and kill your aphids. Um, it can kill your thrips. It can help you that way. You don't want to overuse it. You want to go according to the label and only if you really, really need it. Um, so now I'm going to see, I'm going to keep watching how these spider mites do because I also see another little spider on the plant and I know he's going to take care of that too. So we want to nurture our um, natural predators and our beneficial insects. They will help maintain a balance on your porch. And when you notice things starting to get out of balance, that's when you may want to think about some horticultural oil. And going into how to deal with different pests is a whole other talk that we maybe don't have time for. 
Um, but that's just something to consider. Yes. All right, Melissa, there is a question about the water bottles. Do okay. your bottles in your containers have taps on the ends? Taps on the ends. No, they do not. I will just take one out and show you. This is my bottle. It is a wine bottle uh, that I took the label off of because it was looking grungy. And it, there's nothing on the top at all. It's just a narrow necked bottle. I do recommend narrow necked. I mean, I, I wouldn't put a mason jar or anything or uh, a large mouth bottle. Um, some wine bottles have very short necks and uh, wide mouths. I wouldn't recommend those. I would recommend something with a narrow neck and a narrow mouth like this. Um, and what I do is I just fill it straight up and stick it right um, directly into the pot. So it'll be totally filled up. You will lose a little water when you do this and you just flip it right upside down and stick it into the pot like that. Um, and what I also do is I will, I'm trying to make sure y'all can see it. I will kind of push down and twist. And what that does, it kind of forms a cork of soil to make sure it doesn't all go gushing out. Um, so that's gonna be what activates that kind of natural slow release action. Um, through the soil there. So yeah, no taps, nothing fancy, just a just an upside down bottle. Okay, what else we got? Let's see. Um, another question was, which variety of mint is best for lemonades and teas? I would go, ooh, so lemonades and teas, I would recommend um, the traditional peppermint, spearmint, mojito mint, and julep mint. Um, you can also, sometimes people like a creamier tea, there's a chocolate mint that would work very well for that. Um, but those are also kind of the four main culinary mints that are very easy to find. I, I, I didn't hear someone, I didn't hear, I saw somebody ask where to get curry plants. They're actually readily available at big box stores, but they're also available at uh, local centers. So I don't know where um, that person is based out of. But um, here in Decatur, there's a place called the Wild Center. A lot of your local um, nature centers or local farms will be having um, plant sales and plant starts. So look into that. See if you can find a local source. Pikes is also a good local chain to look into. Their staff is very knowledgeable and they have a variety of different things. Um, but yeah, you can find curry plants, all sorts of cool stuff uh, around this time of year. Okay, so what else? Another question was, can I dehydrate in an air fryer? I don't know. I probably, I don't know enough about air fryers to, 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 to say. I wish I did. <laughs> um, if it can behave like an oven, if you can put the air fryer uh, down to 100 degrees, I would say probably, but I've never personally used one. So I may need to look into that. Okay, what other questions did we note? Um, I know we are losing some participants. Before y'all go, I am going to post a link to a survey. If y'all would fill this survey out, I would really, really appreciate it. Um, this is how we kind of gather information on how to make our programs the best they could possibly be. Um, so let me just, it logged me out, so I just need to find that link real quick for y'all. Uh, and Ashley, you can throw another question or two at me while I do this. Okay, great. Um, one of the questions was, what herbs will keep through the winter months? Um, a lot of your perennials, like, well, it depends on what you mean keep through the winter months. Um, rosemary is evergreen, so that's a really great option. And then, um, a lot of your herbs are perennials, but they are not green through the winter, um, if that makes sense. So your thyme and your mint will die back over the winter. Um, sorry, my computer is kind of freaking out. I really need this link. Um, but yeah, they'll die back over the winter, but they'll come right back because they have a really strong root system. Basil won't do that. Never presume basil will do that. Um, I've had a lot of trouble getting it to come back. Um, and then, yeah, I'd say thyme, oregano, mint, 
rosemary, lavender are all really good perennial options. Okay. So someone just asked, would it help moving them inside during the winter to help them last longer? Potentially. It, it potentially can. You will probably see them still get a little scraggly because of the reduced daylight hours in general. Um, it's not necessarily just the cold that cues them to dial back their production, um, but also day length. So ah, here is that link. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can bring them inside. I've definitely done that before with my sage plant. Um, I brought it inside and it stayed leafy, um, but you could definitely see it was a little scraggly. It was a little bit leggy. It didn't like being inside at all. Um, okay, so I, in the chat. Melissa, someone does have their hand raised. Okay, cool. Um, let's see, I cannot, for some reason, I cannot see that on my end. Um, okay. Who has their hand raised? It's O-L-A-W-A-L-E. Olawale, okay. Olawale. Um, can you type your question in the chat? Olawale, what are, what can we do for you? And also everyone, that link I just posted in the chat, if y'all could please go to that survey, fill it out, let us know um, what you liked about today. Oh, and iPad 2 has their hand raised. Can we, can we help you? Can you type in the chat? Let me see. Let me, I can try to unmute you. Hello, Ollie, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Do you have a question? Oh, thanks. Yes, thanks. I was just going back to your question about the pots. So are you saying that a black color plastic pot is not too good? And could you show me that bottle thing again? The one yes. you have? So thanks. Yeah, okay. So the, the thing about the colored pots, that's not saying it's not good because a lot of the defaults, um, you know, tomato containers, a lot of the cheap five gallon containers are going to be black. And that's fine. It's not going to kill your plant, but it's something you need to be oh, wow. aware of. So if you have something in a white pot, it may not uh, need as much water as something in a black pot. You may need okay. it at different rates. Um, and also, you may have a tomato in a white pot and a tomato in a black pot, both in full sun, but the tomato in the black pot starts to kind of wilt and get yellowy, even though uh, you're watering them the same, they have the same nutrition, that may be a sign of heat stress. Okay. All so that's right. what I meant by that. So just, it's not necessarily that it's worse, it's just something to take into account. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then did you see, want to see one of the um, pots specifically? Yeah, the, the how you had the bottle. The, you know, did you oh. add, um, I, I couldn't see that properly. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so this is my citronella scented geranium. It's just in a brightly colored plastic container. Um, okay. What I have, can you see this okay? Yes. Okay, cool. And it's just a wine bottle. Okay. And I'll fill it and you can kind of see there's like a divot where I keep it. Right. And you just put it in there. But okay. it's several times just setting it in there, the soil can get a little compact. Um, and it, it, the water may just all run right out. So you want to take it and just kind of push it down in and twist it every time you do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Hey, Melissa, people are having trouble with the link for the survey, but if they click on the link directly, it'll take them straight to the survey. Yes. But yes. it's also been asked if you could email it as well. I definitely will. I will definitely send a follow-up email. That's why I had y'all, I have everybody's email um, previously, so that's why I wanted to see who actually logged in. Um, so again, if you have not put your name in the chat yet, please go ahead and put your name in the chat. Um, so again, with Zoom, sometimes one way works for some people, another way works for other people. It's a little crazy, but we're working through it. So thank y'all so much for your patience. Okay, and if it doesn't let you click on it, try copying and pasting it. Um, some people had no trouble, awesome. Survey completed, awesome, thank you, Katrina. Ah, you guys are great, this is awesome. Um, great, so we are gonna be, we are still recording. I'm probably gonna stop the recording soon, 
Um, so we will have all one hour and 10 minutes of this posted on our YouTube. We're gonna post the link several different places. Ashley's gonna share it on the Muskogee County or the uh, UGA Extension Columbus link. Um, we're gonna share it on our Facebook pages and UGA Fulton County. Um, and so y'all can watch it. Please share it. Um, I know it's a long video, but it's, I think a lot of folks will get some use out of it. Um, so thank you so much for uh, this, ah, Ginger. <laughs> uh, that's another talk. Ginger can be pretty difficult. Um, okay. Um, a couple of questions about donations. That's very, very generous. Um, you can make donations to your local county extension office just by writing a check to UGA uh, extension county name uh, slash 4H typically. Um, so you're welcome to uh, donate to your local 4-H program, your local agriculture program, things like that. Um, but yeah, we will definitely be sharing uh, the link on YouTube and we will be posting the link in the event page. So uh, very sorry if I didn't get to your questions in that follow-up email. I'm saving the chat so I'll, if there's any other good questions I missed, I'll type that up and uh, send that to y'all just for your reference. And I'll also send you the publication that I gleaned a lot of this information from. All right, so if that's it, um, I'm gonna post the link one more time. Oh, let's see. Let's post it one more time to everyone. Again, please click on that link, fill it out. We're gonna email it out to you. Um, thank y'all very, very, very much. Uh, the turnout was huge. The response was awesome. We're excited for the next two um, talks. Ashley on the screen is going to be giving her talk on vegetables same time next Tuesday. Um, something we will mention, um, it will probably be a different Zoom link because we had such huge capacity issues this time. <laughs> um, so be on the lookout for that. But with that, um, I think that's it. So if y'all are okay, I'm going to stop recording.